We think about forgiveness today in the house that Jim built. Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, who called us to live to a higher standard each day and not be satisfied with just a little empty religion in life as a shallow substitute for giving God our best. Our series will continue in the coming weeks as we hear from family, friends, and others influenced by the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. Hey, it's good to have you with us. Well, we will be thinking about forgiveness today as we hear from Steve McCauley, son of Ed McCauley, who was one of the five men killed in Operation Alka. And we'll be hearing from the niece of Elizabeth Elliot, Andrea Hawthorne. They'll both talk about forgiveness, and uh, we'll get to that a little later. We'll also, our two Gateway to Joy programs will feature our continuing short series on a trip to Ecuador. Stay with us. Well, let's get to part two in a trip to Ecuador. Unexpected greetings. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, continuing today with my story of the trip that my husband and I took to Ecuador in January of 1996. I told about how amazingly the Lord took us to the airport in Boston in spite of a very big blizzard, got us on a plane when we were only on standby, enabled us to meet my daughter and her husband in Miami and to get on a flight to Quito. And then to our amazement, the Lord even arranged our transportation from the city of Quito, which is high in the Andes, over 9,000 feet above sea level, down into the jungle which is the place where we were most interested in going because that's where my Indian friends lived. And how we arrived at a little little town called Tana, and most wonderfully, the Lord led us almost immediately, even in so big a, a metropolis, to a young Quechua man who knew my friend Venancio, who was sort of the key man to our visit in that section of the jungle. We didn't know how to find Venancio, the Lord did, and he sent this young man along. So here we are in the van. He is directing us to go down this road and then take this turn here. And it was not very far before he said, well, we need to turn around here. I think we went past the house. So Steve Saint, son of Nate Saint, the pilot who had been killed by Alka Indians in 1956, his son Steve is now a missionary pilot in Ecuador. Steve was driving. He said to my husband, Lars, well, how does it look back there? Do you think I can back up to turn around? And Lars said, yeah, it looks fine. Well, lesson one, Lars says, don't tell anybody that until you've gotten out and tested things because Steve backed up the van and we sank to the hubcaps in mud. Well, while they were struggling to try to get that out and a good many Indians showed up with shovels and rocks and boards and manpower, I said to Eduardo, our guide, this young Quechua man whom I had not known, but we found him, Eduardo and I walked down the road to find Venancio. Eduardo said he knew where Venancio lived. We got to the house. We knocked on the door. No answer. We knocked again. We called. We waited. Finally, a girl stuck her head out the window And we said, is Venancio here? No, he doesn't live here anymore, she said. But but he lives over there. And she pointed just a short way down the street. So down the muddy lane we went to the house. And sure enough, Anna, Venancio's wife, was there. She fell into my arms, cried, wept, hugged me, wailed the death wail, which is sort of customary when you haven't seen anyone for many, many years and it had been more than 30 years since I had seen her. And I said, your husband, where is he? And she said, Quito Marishka. He has gone to Quito. Gone to Quito? Yes, he had to see the doctor. Well, of course, my heart sank. What shall we do? What do we do now? But she said, don't worry, senora, he will be back today. Well, I said, how can he be back today? It's a five-hour drive to Quito, 
He has to find the doctor. He has to go to the hospital. And he's going to come back again. Yes, senora, he will be back today. Well, I didn't believe her. But anyway, we went on. Eduardo said, I know where you can stay the night. I had asked Benancio to make arrangements for us. But it turned out that the arrangements that he had thought he could make were not valid. And so Eduardo said, my father has a place where you can stay. His father was Clemente Chimbu, a very godly man also, one of the pastors of the Quichua church in a place called Pano. So I said, can you take us to his house? He said, yes. So he got back in the van. We drove a very short distance, and he stopped. He told us to stop. And he said, now we have, we have everything that you need. Well, I couldn't believe this, because when I lived in the jungle, nobody had anything in the way of accommodations. The Indians themselves usually slept either in hammocks or on board beds with no mattresses, no blankets. And here were five of us gringos, as they call foreigners. Where were we to spend the night? Well, we had prayed. We had asked the Lord simply to direct us as he willed. So we got out of the car, and he said, we have a place for you to sleep. And I said, well, what kind of a place? Well, we have houses. You have houses? And what's in them? Senora, he was getting a little bit fed up with me, we have beds. We have mattresses. We have sheets. We have blankets. We have pillows. And we have mosquito nets. Will that be okay? Well, I still found it incredible. But he said, why don't you come and have a look? So Walt, my son-in-law, Lars, my husband, and I went down the trail after Eduardo. It wasn't very far before we came to a beautiful, clear, running river, the Pano River, and a lovely rocky beach. And there were five neat little bamboo houses with thatched roofs. Here they are, he said. Do you want to see the inside? We looked inside. Sure enough, there were beds and mattresses on the beds. But he said, we have the sheets and the blankets and the other things up at the house. I'll fix them up, and then you can decide whether you want to stay here. Well, of course, by this time, I had made up my mind. There'd be no question we would stay there. The accommodations were amazingly luxurious. So sure enough, about an hour later, he came down to the little, shall we call it, the living room. This was about six poles with a thatched roof on the top, no walls. But this was a little place to sit. They had hammocks. It was obvious that there had been a fire there. And there was a monkey tied up for our entertainment. He was chattering and screeching. There was a parrot who talked to us. And there was a little girl who came along and went right up a tree and brought down some wild grapes. It was just as if all the entertainment that these foreigners needed had been thought of. And there were those neat little shacks, shall we call them, huts. Cabanas might be a better word. And so we had supper there. They said, what would you like for supper? Well, I said, what can you get us? They said, well, we can get you anything you want, because in Tena, that big town, they bring down food from the mountains. So they have all the vegetables, they have fruits, they have meat, they have anything. So I said, well, just bring us vegetables. Who will cook it? Clemente said, my wife and my daughter. So sure enough, not very long after that, here came two men carrying huge sacks. They looked about the size of a 100-pound potato sack, loaded with vegetables. The women set to work in the tiny little lean-to kitchen. I don't think you would have really wanted to inspect the kitchen, but I was used to that sort of thing and thought it would be just as well if none of our party took a peek in there. But they had a dining room with a table, benches, candles... They had boiled water for us, and we soon had a very nice supper of vegetables. They gave us jungle tea, something called wayusa, which comes from a shrub that grows nearby. And then we sat around the campfire. We fanned up the fire. We sat in the hammocks and on the benches that they had in that so-called living room. And we were chattering away when suddenly... Who should arrive but Venancio, the man who had gone to Quito to see the doctor that day? 
my dear friend, the one who had been the pastor and the teacher on the station called Shandia, where Jim and I had worked together with the Quechua Indians. How could he possibly have gotten up and back to and from Quito in one day? He explained it to us. I left, he said, at one o'clock in the morning. Well, of course, we embraced with tremendous enthusiasm. I couldn't believe that God had led us so wonderfully. O oh, ye of little faith. And Venancio explained to us that he had meant to provide hospitality for us. And he, what he meant by that was that he was going to build a whole cement house for us to stay in. But he hadn't been able to get the permission from the government. So we had a wonderful time. We sang Quechua songs such things as Jesus Nika, Jesus Nika, my gang's new gama shamung, mana pitas cal pachichachu, my gang's new gama shamung, and Jesus Cristo al amigo, new canchira compañan, paita tu cuira cuenta shung. Pai tu cuira riparang, ya kiri shaliara ringi, corazon julia shayang, y marasha wakangiri, Jesu Cristo yanapang. Now, that's not my real singing voice, but that's my Quechua singing voice. And, of course, I tried to both speak and sing the language the way they did, so that it didn't sound too peculiar. Well, it was a wonderful evening. The stars came out, the lightning bugs came out, the crickets began to make a tremendous racket, the tree toads up in the thatched roof, the monkey would chatter every once in a while, and the parrot would squawk and screech and say things to us. And finally we said good night, and we went into our little bamboo huts with the thatched roofs. Part two in our five-part look at a trip to Ecuador, Unexpected Greetings. One of our themes today will be forgiveness, as we'll hear later on from Andrea Hawthorne, niece of Elizabeth Elliot, as she talks about how we can explain the forgiveness from the families of the five martyrs in Operation Alka. One of those uh, family members, Steve McCauley, lost his father, Ed, in that uh, violent encounter. He talks about his mother, Ed McCauley's wife, his wife, Mary Lou. Did she struggle to forgive the Alka or Walrani people who had killed her husband? She would talk to us anytime we wanted to, as kids, as far back as I can remember, or then as, you know, as adults, as grown-ups. Obviously, she loved my dad, and I think she liked talking about him, and she was very proud of what, what they had done, and she was so grateful that God had had used it, you know, so greatly. Because when the, these five guys are killed, you know, nobody knows what's going to become of it. And the initial reaction of a lot of believers is, you know, what a waste. You know, how can this, this is going to set back missions forever? Who's going to want to go in the mission field, you know, after these guys have this happened? But what I remember about my mom was, and I don't know this at the time, but I'm three years old. I learned it later. She never once had that attitude. She uh, never once felt like this was a waste. You know, her heart was broken, but she trusted that God knew what he was doing. She used to say to me, if we believe in an all-knowing, all-loving God, all-powerful God, infinitely wise, doesn't it seem like sometimes things are going to happen that are beyond our comprehension? She, I can remember also as when somebody asked her about forgiving the Wadani, she said, you know what? I never felt like I needed to forgive the Wadani. She said, I can understand if somebody breaks into your house and steals your stuff or breaks into your house and kills somebody, they need forgiveness. But these Walani, that was what they did. That's how they lived, you know. And even the missionaries didn't know the, the extent of the violence. They knew that everybody else was terrified of this people group. They didn't know of the violence within the people group. 
But she said, I, I never felt like I needed to forgive them because they, they were just doing, you know, they didn't know any other way of life. Steve McCauley, whose father, Ed, was one of those who died in Operation Alka, reaching out to that tribal group. Later on, we'll hear from a relative of Elizabeth Elliott talking again about the forgiveness from the families of the five martyrs. But right now, it's part three, a trip to Ecuador. Let's hear about the house that Jim Elliott built. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliott, continuing my story today of a most wonderful trip in which we were very conscious of the fact that underneath are the everlasting arms. We have a guide, a guard, a shepherd, a savior, one who leads us and promises to direct our paths. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. We found this to be true. Lars, my husband, and I took my daughter Valerie and her husband and her oldest son, Walter III, to Ecuador in January of 1996. I wanted to visit my old friends, the Indians, Quichuas, and the Alcas, the people who live in the eastern jungle, and I wanted Valerie to have the experience of going back to the place where she had lived until she was eight years old, and she had only been there uh, very briefly, twice in 1966 and 1976, so she had not been there since 1976, and there were tremendous changes that had taken place, and it was my great desire to allow her to show these places to her husband, who had grown up also as a missionary kid, he in Africa. So I left you yesterday singing around a campfire with a group of Indians on a small river called the Pano River, where Clemente Chimbu, a Christian man, has established a sort of a little tourist place. He has built some little bamboo huts with thatched roofs, and he actually has real beds with foam rubber mattresses and sheets and blankets and pillows and mosquito nets. Now, that doesn't sound like great luxury to us who are so used to such lavish luxury, such unspeakable, appalling luxuries. But for a jungle Indian to do something like that was just amazing to me, and I really couldn't believe it until I saw it. But that's where we stayed that night. And believe me, my husband and Walt and Walter had the experience of hearing how it can rain in the rainforest. I mean, it can rain. It just so happens that as I'm recording this program, we're having a violent rainstorm in the wintertime in Massachusetts. But it sort of adds a little background noise. Maybe you can hear the battering of the rain on the window. It's nothing like the rain in the rainforest, though. Believe me, we woke up about 3 o'clock, and the rain was coming down as hard as anyone could ever imagine that it would come down. And you know what happens next? It turns up the volume, and it comes down harder and louder, and you can't believe that that kind of thatch is going to withstand that battering But I remember when my husband Jim had the Indians build our first house for us in a place called Puyupungu, which was also a Quechua Indian station. Jim kept track of the leaves for the thatch that he bought from the Indians, and he weighed each bundle. And he was able to figure out that that thatched roof weighed between six and seven tons. Can you believe that? Well, it rained, and it rained, and it rained, and it was still raining when we got up in the morning, and of course we had to go down to the river to brush our teeth, and we got slightly soaked, and there was a little outhouse there, another unheard of convenience in the jungle, and then we took a bus to go to Shandia. Now, there were no roads in those days. It was a six-hour walk from Tana to Shandia back in my day, but this was about a 15-minute ride over a rather bumpy road in a bus. And when we got onto the bus, it was packed with people, but very kindly they tried to squeeze together so that they could get these five foreigners in there. And as 
One of the women was moving to make a seat for Valerie. She suddenly looked at her and she said, I know you. You are Valeria. You are Valerie. I used to play with you. I remember your dolls. Remember the playhouse that you had. Remember the night that it fell, fell down. Can you imagine? This woman was also in her 40s. Valerie is 41. She recognized her. She had not seen her since they were both about eight years old. The Lord, the hand of the Lord, step after step after step. We got to Shandia. The bus let us off there, and there were Indians waiting to greet us. We walked down what used to be the airstrip, which has now become a road. We visited in one or two of the little Indian houses, and there in one of them sat old Awako. Awako and her husband and family were squatters on our property. They lived not very far from our house, off in the forest. Now, Awako, I thought, was very old when we left in 1963. Indians age pretty fast. So the fact that she was still alive made me just incredulous. But sure enough, there was old Awako. So I figure she must be in her 80s now, weazened, tiny, stringy gray hair, very sad looking. Her husband had died. And as far as I know, poor old Awako has never become a Christian. You might put her in your prayers. We sat there by the fire with her for a little while and talked to her. And then we took the trail down to the end of the airstrip to the cliff. Any of you who have read Shadow of the Almighty may remember that Jim and Pete, his colleague, when they were single men, lived in Shandia together for the first year of their missionary work. And Jim spent that time repairing three old buildings that had been destroyed or almost destroyed by termites. And he built two brand new buildings. And one night, there was a tremendous flood in the Atunyaku, which is one of the headwaters of the Napo River, which is one of the headwaters of the Amazon. A great flood undercut the cliff on which Jim and Pete's house stood. And they had to watch helplessly as the house went over the cliff. Well, we stood there and looked down over that cliff, thinking of what an experience that must have been for them. In fact, all five of the buildings that Jim had worked on went down the river in one night in a flood in 1953. Then we took the trail along the edge of the cliff, through the forest, and up to the house that Jim had built. A few people would even imagine that the house that Jim built in 1953 and 54. Few would imagine that it was still standing, but it is. It has cement floor, cement up to the window sills, boards from there up, board walls, and then aluminum roof. And a group of Indians had moved in. The squatters who had lived in the forest had now moved into that house. And, of course, Valerie wanted to see the house and to show it to her husband, the house in which she remembered growing up. So we looked at the place where the radio was when I got word that my husband was missing. I'll never forget that day, of course. It was January the 9th. The five men had been killed on January the 8th, but of course I did not know that. I got a short wave radio message on the morning of January the 9th asking me to come back on for a special contact with Missionary Aviation Fellowship. And when I went back on for that contact, I learned that my husband was missing along with the other four men. And so there was the cabinet that Jim had made for the shortwave radio. And then we went back into what used to be our bedroom, and I pointed out the place where I had written through Gates of Splendor, I had revised through Gates of Splendor, I should say, and where I had written Shadow of the Almighty. And Walt and Val and their son wandered through the rooms. Valerie pointed out her room, the guest room, the school room. It sounds like a pretty civilized house, and it was, of course, but it's pretty much a shambles now. Various vandals have been in and torn out the drawers and torn off the doors and cupboards. But the Indians who are living there are perfectly happy because they built themselves a little lean-to kitchen so that they can have an open fire to do their cooking. Well, then we went and sat down in the living room. They had a table and a few benches, and they brought on some chicha, which is a drink made by chewing 
manioc and then spitting it out into the mass and squishing it around with their fingers and wrapping it up in palm leaf packages and letting it sit for a couple of days so that the saliva causes fermentation. And then they take a fistful out of a package, put it into a bowl of water, squish it up with their hands, and offer it to you to drink. Well, we sat there and we drank some chicha. I hasten to assure you that it is not intoxicating at that stage. And we had, let's see, what else did we have? We had some manioc. Um, I think we had some palm fruit. I've forgotten what else they gave us, but it was mostly the chicha which is a very nourishing drink. It must have a lot of B vitamins in it because I've known people to live on it for weeks, and I've even known babies to be raised on it when their mothers have died. Then a most unbelievable, shall we say, coincidence, but there are no coincidences in God's economy, a most incredible coincidence took place. But I'm not going to tell you about that now. I'm going to tell you about that one tomorrow. Part three in a trip to Ecuador. This is a five-part series that will conclude next time. That was The House That Jim Built. Well, before we go, we continue thinking about forgiveness. How do you forgive somebody who killed your family member, whether it was a father, an uncle, or anybody else? Andrea Hawthorne is the niece of Elizabeth Elliot. She summarizes it in one word, obedience. Probably a common theme word for both of our families would be the word obedience. And so I don't know that there was as much of some emotional feeling of, oh, I forgive and I feel really good about going back. And there was a very strong teaching and belief and foundation of obedience. And so... I would say that's why Jim went in in the first place, and then Elizabeth went back, and then why Uncle Bert as well would carry on in that same vein of forgiving and being obedient to what Christ calls us to. Andrea Hawthorne, niece of Elizabeth Elliot and daughter of Jim Howard. Well, our time together is coming to an end, but let me thank you for letting us come into your home, your office, maybe along with you as you took a walk, wherever we found you today. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org. More talks, devotionals, videos, and other resources. elizabethelliot.org. Well, from Apple Podcasts, from Ansie Louie comes this note. I am blessed listening to Elizabeth. God used her mightily, and she responded in obedience to her God. Well, thanks for joining us, and until next time, when we get back together, may God remind you each and every day that you are loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are the everlasting arms.